the Full Circle Podcast, compelling interviews and incredible tales from Colorado's Western Slope, from the mountains to the desert. Christy Reese and her team hear from the movers, shakers, and characters of the Grand Valley and surrounding mountain towns that make the Western Slope the place we all love. You'll learn, you'll laugh, you'll love with the Full Circle. All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Full Circle Podcast. I'm Christy Reese, and I'm really excited today to uh, be joined by our incredible guests, Jen Zuner and Ann Keller of the Hot Tomato Restaurant in Fruita. Yay! Hi, ladies. Hi, Hi Christy. How's it going? Great. Good. How are you? Really good, thanks. Well, I'm sorry we can't be... Here today. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry we can't be together in the same room, but... Uh, Second best option is I yeah. think we're, we're talking live. And, uh, and we don't have something over our faces or like that? <laughs> I know. We don't have masks on. Yes. How nice. <laughs> so, um, gosh, so many things to talk about, but let's just get started on a little background. I know you guys are coming up on 20 years in Fruta. Is that right? Uh, 18 in Fruta. Uh-huh. Yeah, tomato. Okay. So pretty close to 20. Yeah, you close. Can just and, say, yeah. <laughs> close enough, right? Um, a love of bicycles is really what brought you here. Is that right? Yep. And so tell me about your bicycle history. Whoa, you should go. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started my bicycle history started when I was itty bitty. Um, I grew up racing BMX in New Jersey with my brother's. Uh, my dad at one point opened a, a bicycle shop and he had a BMX track and my brothers and I had a fairly big age gap. And so when they were kind of getting out of the BMX scene, I was really starting to accelerate in the BMX scene. So I stayed with that um, a lot longer after they had kind of like gone and started their families and things like that. Um, and I had the opportunity to just to travel around a lot um, all over the country, BMX racing And I was on the professional circuit doing that. And then natural progression as I got older was to find my way into mountain bikes. I mean, dabbled a little bit on the road, um, but I really found a love for mountain biking in the probably the the mid 80s. Is there Uh, mountain biking in New Jersey? uh, No, at that point I had moved. I had graduated high school and I was just kind of following the mountain bike circuit all over the country. And I actually had landed in the Midwest for a while. Um, and I worked for a bicycle distributor there and it was actually GT bikes. And I was, uh, involved with like kind of opening up the mountain biking, uh, gates, if you will, to the Midwest and did a lot of, uh, development with trail building back then and putting on events and such. And then I jumped onto the mountain bike pro circuit in the early nineties. And I did that up until the late nineties, um, Then I moved to Moab, Mm -hmm. and that's where I met Anne. Um, She also had this fondness for mountain bikes, and we just started riding together. So that's basically my backstory of of bikes. Yeah. How about you, Anne? You were a guide for a while, right? Hmm? You were a guide, a mountain biking guide? I I did, yeah. When When I lived in Moab prior to moving to Fruta, um, I don't have a, a big history with bikes. I have uh, embarrassingly had training wheels on my bike until like a really late age. <laughs> we just took them off. Because I, I love, I love my mother dearly, but she was a little bit of a safety Sally. So yeah, I wish, you know, that I grew up with like the BMX background and all that as a kid, but um, no, nope, not me. So I didn't get into mountain biking until I was about 19. And then made up for a lot of last like lost years by getting really involved into it and dropping out of college and moving to Moab. (laughs) So can you remember like the first time you mountain biked either one of you, like really on a, on a mountain bike that was specifically, you know, made for trails and what, where was it and what kind of trail was it and how did it make you feel? I I can, I I can answer that. Uh, I was in St. Louis, Missouri and I was on a, GT to Cuesta and it had a really funky paint job and it was it had like this blue splatter and that was like all the rage at the time and uh, my first ride was at a place called Greensfelder Mountain Bike Park and it was actually an equestrian park and it was it, all the trails were hiking trails 
And I remember we went out with our mountain bikes that we had just gotten from GT. And I remember we had um, toe clips, like the ones that you like slid your, you know, like. Yeah, little basket. Little yeah. basket thing. And I remember coming from a BMX background and having those on and riding about, I don't know, five minutes time-wise and just ripping them off of my bike because <laughs> I could not keep my feet in them. And, you know, the, the terrain, because it was a hiking trail, as we no, now, you know, we have separate trails. Back then, we didn't have that. So riding was really challenging. But I remember coming home after that, well, actually sitting in the parking lot after that and just feeling exhilarated, just like for everything. Like I was tired. It was hard. It was an experience. I think that trail was, I think it was a six-mile loop. And I <laughs> want to say it took us like four hours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you're whooped. And you're what? Yeah, I like, think you went and ate like fast food or something <laughs> dumb, and just like that was it. That was that started this whole like huh piece of, of it all, huh? Do you remember yours, Anne? Like your you know, first real yeah. mountain bike ride? I remember the first day I bought a real mountain bike. I lived in Northern California, and I had scrounged up all my money for this hardtail giant old mountain bike in I think 1997 and I remember driving it home and getting out of the car and hopping on it and I rode about 15 feet down a gravel road and realized that I had about 300 goat heads in each tire <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of my very first ride of my very first <laughs> real mountain bike <laughs> but I, yeah I had a good one shortly after that yeah I started mountain biking in northern California in the bay area which have uh, great trails out there? No, they have terrible trails out there. <laughs> they have an amazing, amazing cycling scene, phenomenal road riding. People are really gung ho about cycling, but the, the trails are terrible um, because there's hardly any. So yeah. you, you have to like sit in the car. Yeah, you have to sit in a car in traffic for like an hour to go ride your bike. Yeah. So what, what bikes do you ride now? Um, I'm on a Pivot Mach 6. And it's a company down in Arizona, and we're friends with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm on an Evil Reckoning. Evil's a Washington-based company. Awesome. Yeah. And uh, we just produced this video that you guys were part of. We haven't released it yet, but you know you're from the Grand Valley if. And one of the lines <laughs> there is, you, you know you're from the Grand Valley if your bike is worth more than your car. Is that yeah. true for you guys? Uh, you know, I think that that stereotype has largely <laughs> changed. You know, now mountain bikers have these like $60,000 sprinter van build outs. And so I, I think that was very much true when we both got into mountain biking. But I think, I think that's changed a little bit. Yeah. Because now we actually have jobs. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've all grown up a little bit. <laughs> well, let's talk about your job. Um, you guys moved to Fruta and we're working at the bike shop. Mm -hmm. And... How did you have an idea to start a, a restaurant? And did either one of you have restaurant experience? No. <laughs> nope. Blissful ignorance, Christy. Right. We, uh, you know, we were working at Over the Edge, and we kept hearing people say, where do we go to, to eat in this town? And at the time, there really wasn't much. There was a Diorio's Pizzeria, which was across the street from the bike shop. There was a little Mexican restaurant down the street. There was mm -hmm. a Domino's and there was the coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And I think that was it. And every, and there was munchies. Um, and then everything else was just like Burger King, McDonald's. Right. And, and so we would hear it a lot at the bike shop where, you know, we just finished this ride. Where can we go grab a beer? Where can we go? And at the time that end zone was open for, was it the end of their run? Do you remember the end zone? No. Can't say that idea. It like, it's where the old, it's where the Fiesta Guadalajara in Fruta is. Okay. And it was, I remember when I came out here to interview with Troy for Over the Edge, we went to the end zone and they had these amazing burgers. And I remember we did a really big ride and then he took me there and I was like, sold. <laughs> <laughs> We're moving. Yeah. And, but they closed. By the time I had taken a job yeah. at Over the Edge and moved here, um, they had closed. And I remember being really sad about it. Because I was like, well, where are we going to eat? <laughs> so that, you know, of course, like escalated as we worked at the bike shop. And it wasn't just us asking, where do we go to eat? It was all the, all the visitors, that, the tourists that were coming through asking, where do you go to eat? And so 
the Diorios was across the street. And for me growing up in Jersey, I just, I really missed good pizza. And I would always go into Diorios and I would say, um, you know what you should do? <laughs> hey, you know what you should do about pizza? <laughs> and I grew up, when I, when I grew up, you know, there was a place like the Hot Tomato on every street corner and, and everybody knew your name and everybody knew whose kids you were. And I worked at many of them, but I never made, I never made a pizza. It yeah. just, because I was a girl. So you just could just take the order and serve it. To and look cute, wear a skirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just try to look cute. Um, so I did that a lot. So when I, I just kind of had this idea, I knew that they were, you know, Diorios had their thing. And I kept going in and saying, what, what do you, what do you, you know what you should do? And trying to add all this stuff. And one day I walked in and I said, hey, you know what you should do? And they said, you know what you should do? And I was like, what? <laughs> They're like you should just buy restaurant. Yeah, <laughs> you should just buy this, and that was kind of like the impetus to like get it going in my head. And, and so, was there a point when you said to Anne, "I know what we should do. We should open a pizza place"? No, I don't think I ever said that. Uh, no, well, you when you were gonna buy when the offer came up to buy the Diorio's equipment, she did, and my response was like. Oh, oh, that's nice. <laughs> like, have fun with She's that. She's like, you go and do that. And I was like, but we well, can't have good pizza. <laughs> like, I don't think Anne at that early, early stage of our relationship, I don't think you knew what good pizza was and that I grew up in that and that it was really important for me to have that. And I think it was, you know, I really enjoyed working at the bike shop and being in the customer service realm. So I think it was much more than just the pizza it was yeah. the whole atmosphere and the whole feeling that you get that right. I remember that's nostalgic to me. Like when I go home, I always go into a pizzeria because it's that feeling. And I really wanted to try to figure out a way to create that and have a place where other people could come and feel that and have a, have an awesome place to hang out and tell a their stories. Community meeting center, a place oh. to drink beer and tell stories about your bike ride. Yeah. And that was, you know, at that time, it was really, really, really missing in this, in this small community. I mean, and since then, it's definitely pushed, pushed forward a ton. I loved hearing that from you because I think uh, I grew up in a small town and we had that sense, you know, I mean, we didn't have um, a ton of restaurants, but they were all community meeting centers, right? Like the whole town was your family. And I think those of us that think of New Jersey you don't think of there being that sense of community, but the, that's what those little pizza places were, you know, in the big towns, it, little micro communities. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, it doesn't matter if you're in a rural small town or even in a big city, because even when you're in a big city, those places are that place for that two mile radius, right? Yeah. That's the hometown feel. Yeah. So that so, was really, really important to me at that time. Yeah. So did you, model uh, your ideas of hot tomato or your recipes after some of those places? And did you, did you go back to New Jersey and say, I need some, some recipes from you friends? Well, actually I did a little bit better and I got my parents to come out and my mom <laughs> is a really good cook. Um, I grew up in a small Italian community. And so you could bounce from, from like house to house and ask who was cooking what. And that's where you decided where you were going to eat that night. Like who had the best meal on the, on the table. <laughs> uh, my mother, she still teases me about that. Um, but I was able to, I like to say, talk them into coming here, both my mom and my dad, when I was getting to the point of really seriously thinking about doing this. And my dad is a, he's a mechanic by trade, so he can fix anything. So I was like, oh, this will be great because, you know, the deal was I was going to buy all the equipment. Um, and then I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, there was no real plan. Yeah. Um, so I was like, all right, I got my dad coming to check on all this equipment to make sure it's worthwhile and worth the prices that they're asking for. And my mom will teach me how to do this stuff. <laughs> and that's basically how it started. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's still, we still use my mother's marinara recipe. Wow. Uh, awesome. Our yeah. mixer that we make all of our dough every day. My mother's name is Charlotte, and we named the mixer Charlotte <laughs> because if it wasn't for my mom, there wouldn't be me, which is kind of like the same point of dough. If we didn't have really good dough, we wouldn't have really good pizza. So we thought it was appropriate to name our mixer Charlotte. And she uh -huh. is a, a Hobart mixer from the mid-60s. So uh -huh. she's 
older. Not that my mom's old, because I'm not old. Um, but it's really cool to have this vintage piece of um, equipment in our place that still, knock on wood to this day, um, still makes all of our dough every single day. So, Anne, what do you feel like your contributions were in that early part? Like, are you the were you the business mind? Were you the design person? Were you the idea person on, you know, what's it going to look like? What were well, you focusing on at that time? I mean, at first, at the ver- for the ver- first few months, I stayed at the bike shop because I was the paycheck person. <laughs> so <laughs> that was my role. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, I like to think that, you know, my strengths that I brought to the table were the, the brand design and the vision around that. And the graphics, I have a background in art. And so that was largely my contribution over the years. And the, the two of us together, I think, you know, we each, you, you just, as two individuals, you know, you have the opportunity to kind of contribute each of your strengths. And so Jen, with her family background and with the feel that she wanted to create largely brought that to the table. And I think that, you know, I was always tasked with the visual representation of that. Which has done so well. I mean, it's really iconic. And how did you come up with the name? (laughs) Well, we dug, we dug for a really long time. We had the worst names. Yeah. You know, like we were talking. (laughs) Let's hear some of them. We all Um, hear some. I feel like I'm not entirely certain if this is correct, but I feel like there was something like Fat Labrador Cafe at one point. (laughs) It was really like we were digging hard because we just, you know, when you're trying to force something and you just lose inspiration and you go past that point of coming up with anything good. And then you're just like scraping the dredges where you're like, (laughs) these are all terrible. (laughs) So we were at that stage. We were definitely at that stage. And we were actually out on a hike in Devil's Canyon with our dogs. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I have the name. And Anne was like, what? And I'm like, I have a name for the restaurant. And she was like, okay, what? And I said, hot tomato. And I remember you just like stopped in your tracks. And mm-hmm. you're like, where did you come up with that? Yeah. I was like, well, actually. So back in Jersey, again, growing up the Catholic Italian small community, every, every man would call us young women hot tomatoes. Well, the name is vaguely sexist and <laughs> there's the truth. Kind of endearing. Uh-huh. Like, hey, you little hot tomato, bring me my glass of whiskey. And you're like, whatever, Uncle Joe. <laughs> um, and so originally I was holding out on the name because I really wanted to open a bike shop and I wanted it to be called Hot Tomato Cyclery. So that was where my passion truly lied, but that wasn't going to happen. Because at the time, there was no way I was going to open up a bike shop in Fruta because there was one here that was doing really well. And, and I had that connection there. So there was, we weren't doing that. So that's where the name came from. Mm-hmm. So, so you went pizza. Full yeah. in. Mm-hmm. Full in. Because why not? Yeah. Well, what, what else do you think makes your pizza different? And, and talk about your Stromboli, too, because... Wow, that's my absolute favorite thing. That makes me drool. I love the little crusty, cheesy, you know, kind of fried, crispy parts around the edges. That's just heaven. <laughs> um, I think on one hand, what makes our, our actual product different is we, you know, for, our product wasn't that good back in the day. I mean, it was okay. Except for my mother's marinara. That was, that's old. But you had a lot of trial and error as any yeah. of systems. And I remember thinking that, like, you know, it was good. It was okay. But then I'd go home and I'd be like, nah, it's, it needs to be better. And I get, I'm get i going to back off here and I'm going to let Anne take all the credit for this. Because Anne is a, is a data nerd. And she just dug really, really deep into how do we make this better? Um, and how do we, how do we, figure out what we really want. We went to some pizza shows and we met a lot of people within the pizza world. There's a pizza show. Yeah. There's a pizza trade show in Las Vegas. That's a lot of people's dreams to go to that, right? Yes. It's pretty cool. It's kind of amazing. You, just, you eat pizza all day. All you do is eat pizza. It's rad. Yeah. Like you, don't you have to travel too and go eat pizza everywhere around the world, don't you? That's a terrible. Yeah. That's next. Yeah. That's yeah. our next. That's our next one. Um, yeah, there's actually there's like quite a few resources for baking 
and pizza making. There's a there's a dedicated pizza making online forum, of course, because there's forums for everything. And so you can, you know, if you dig, you can definitely find recipe tips. And we just went through a lot of trial and error over a number of years when we decided we wanted to improve the dough. Mm-hmm. So it was it was a lot of testing, a lot of making batches because we had to make you had to commit. You, the dough ball that you end up with is 80 pounds in weight. So you it's definitely, like this big, yeah, it's like this giant. Big giant thing that you tip out of the mixer. And so you're pretty committed to testing in order yeah. to do these trials. So it just slowly got better over the years. The more little like tweaks that you do, it would just improve. And then I and think, it's, mi- it's minor things, Yeah, you know, yeah, baking like, works on nuance for sure. And then I, I think the other thing we did is once we started go, going to the pizza show, like we got invited to go to the pizza show because we didn't even know there was, like we were used to going to the bike train show. And we're like, mm-hmm. pizza? Ooh, we should go. <laughs> and then where, is, where is the pizza show usually? It's oh, in Las Vegas. Vegas. Mm-hmm. Of course. Okay. Um, but we started to, you know, become friends with the people in the industry. And, it, and you know, it, it's interesting because we were both very much in the bike industry. And it, it's kind of the same thing where you just find your people and they help you along the way. And I remember being pretty intimidated at the first, like the first day of the pizza show, mm-hmm. because there's just all these men, all these, well, I'm going to, I'm going to say all these guidos, because <laughs> that's what we call everybody back home, right? Like all these Italian drop guys dressed to the nines with their, their pretty, hair slicked yeah, they're back. All slicked back. <laughs> yeah, with their pretty yeah. women that are walking with them <laughs> and talking in these like really harsh, like, east coast accents or a lot of people from italy were there like so a lot of italians would come in for this thing um but we really started to learn like well what you know what do you what cheese do you use or what what tomatoes do you use and how do you do this and how and we really started like i think making the commitment to be like okay if we want to really call ourselves an east coast style pizzeria we gotta like put our money where our mouth is and we gotta like buy the better cheeses and we got to buy the better tomatoes and we got to really work on our dough and get it, get it where it needs to be. And so we've definitely upped the game on our ingredients at that, like about 10 years ago Mm -hmm. um, where we got, you know, instead of getting the less expensive olive oils, like we went to the really expensive olive oil because we put olive oil in our dough. Same thing with our flour, like really finding the right flour mix that they used at these pizzerias that are so iconic around the world. So, and the same thing with cheese, we use a, a company in Wisconsin called Grande and every super solid pizzeria, that's the cheese that you use. Mm-hmm. And it was really fun to start learning that because, you know, back to the original question, like how did we come up with this idea to do this? Mm-hmm. We really had no idea. And we, it was just <laughs> trial and error. And I remember like some of the items we had, we thought were pretty good at the time. And then you start tasting things and you're mm-hmm. like, wow this can of tomatoes versus that can of tomatoes, that can of tomatoes, it really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was really fun for, I think, both of us in those, taking those steps to get us where we are, uh, where we are right now. And so, so you're developing your product, but at the same time, you are having to learn how to be business owners. Oh yeah, there's that. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's a challenge and you're managing employees and hiring and maybe firing and finances and all of that. Who, who took the lead on that? Or was it a joint effort? It was, you know, Jen took more of the paperwork, QuickBooks bookkeeping behind the scenes. I would say we both dealt with employees and growing the organizational structure around the business. And I I think too, we both had a hand in the culture of what, sure, what the hot tomato, you know, we're, I know everybody thinks we're the same person and they get us confused all the time, (laughs) but we're actually very, very, very different. Um, And so it's been interesting to see how two individuals can really pull that love of, of a functioning fun culture together. Yeah be able to put that into our workplace. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that you're really known for is this great workplace culture, not just culture on the front side of the dining room, but in the back. And how do you foster that? 
What do you think are the, the main elements that are important to you that make your culture so great and such a great place to work? Um, I believe that you can't, culture comes from the top down. And so what I love about that is it introduces a sense of humility in that we have to act in the way that we want our staff to act. And in a lot of ways that really keeps you in check when you own a business and not saying that we would go 180 off the rails, you know, left to our own devices, but you, uh, you know, you, you do develop a sense of humility. You learn to apologize, you know, you learn to be honest about things and because you can't expect anyone in your team to give that same level if, if you're not going to bring it yourself. And yeah. I, I think that that's one of the things, and, and that's been, I mean, I'll be honest, like we haven't always been great at that. Like there's moments where we struggle and we definitely were worse at that at the beginning and we've learned and, and I'm, you know, we're to the point where like, I'm, I'm proud of our growth in that, but it has not always been easy. It, it is a challenge to step down off the leadership pedestal. Well, you know, I would say that it's very intentional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like, we don't show up at a meeting like, okay, we're going to have this meeting. Like we work around it and we role play it. And, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's going to be a tough conversation or an easy conversation, we make sure that we're really, we're really ready for that. Um, and for all the things that all the various scenarios that may come our way, because I mean, we have 25 employees. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways that people think when you bring 25 people into a room. I think yeah. that, you know, there's this traditional approach to leadership that thankfully has been changing over the years. That is very, you know, you've got to be strong and you've got to be decisive. And, and really what we need is like, we all just need to read like Brene Brown books and then open <laughs> businesses <laughs> because yeah. it's, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's been amazing what we've been able to, to build around that. It is. And how nice that you have each other to bounce things off of. I mean, not everybody in a relationship can run a business together, right? But you guys do it really do well. Not encourage yeah, I, <laughs> I'm tentative about encouraging other people to do that. <laughs> it comes with challenges. It's a special thing. I mean, you, you guys do it better than most. Mm -hmm. But... I, I'm sure it comes with its challenges. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's why we're out of whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, Life of Pi because I absolutely love that movie. And what did it do for you and your business? Wow. It's been a cool ride for sure. I mean, you guys were well known before that uh, locally, but and and you were doing some articles and and things and getting some national attention. But that really, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure, absolutely, yeah. In Patagonia, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think there's been I mean there's been so many positive things that have come from that. I think for me, probably the thing that I am always reminded of is we still get, like, they just reran it for Thanksgiving, like, on, uh -huh. right? So, all of a sudden, there's, like, all oh, this whole thread of people again, which is so cool. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that, that always, that I come back to, I remember we were having a meeting, you weren't there, we were at the Hot Tomato, and this guy walks in, and he, he had come in to use the, the restroom, we were on the side patio, and uh, it was just before COVID, and um, we were having a meeting, a staff meeting. When restrooms were open. When restrooms were open. <laughs> and he saw me sitting there and he kind of like did a, a double take and he was on his way past me. And then when he came back, he stopped and he said, hey, um, my daughter and I saw your movie. Is it okay if she comes and says hi? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And I was like in the corner of the, one of the little bench, the little bench seats. So I couldn't yeah. get out. And this young woman, young girl, like 12, came up. And I remember she was so nervous. And her dad oh my gosh. Found her, and she was just like, hi, I'm so-and-so. <laughs> and I just really loved your movie. And in that moment, like, it had been probably, you know, a year after it had shown, like, been a big production, if you will. 
And that to me really still stands out. Like that, that movie, like this little girl wanted to come here and ride her bike with her dad because she saw that movie. And it's just like, wow. And then there's been so many other amazing emails that have come through about people with various struggles and just life stuff that they have reached out to us. And that's, that's been really, for me personally, that's been really cool. Mm-hmm. What message are you proudest of in that movie? Um, something that we had to kind of wrap our heads around is that, you know, it's, it's largely coincided with the push within the outdoor industry for diversity, equity, and inclusion. And for us being two gay women, that's been a lot of the positive feedback that we've had from that. And that's not something that you really think about on the day-to-day basis. You know, Mm -hmm. we, we don't, we didn't go into the business to represent gay people in a business realm, right? But what you realize, and, and the movie has definitely brought this to light for us, is that your everyday actions are your representation. And so for us, getting that positive feedback, like we kind of had to step back and think about the importance of that. And that's been pretty rewarding because that's been, I'd say, the overarching narrative of the comment of the comments that we've received from it is is in regards to our place both in the outdoor industry and also in the business realm as gay women and so that's been i think the biggest thing that's kind of struck me that's come from the movie is that that was impactful for people and and to that we're proud of that that that's been something that was unanticipated because it's not something we largely think about much on a day-to-day basis, but to you guys see- aren't thinking about the fact that you're gay all the time. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. You know, you're just like, I'm just living my life. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I really enjoyed watching it again this week. Um, in fact, I watched it a couple of times and I loved reading the comments on YouTube. Like, you really did inspire a lot of people and inspire people to come to Grand Junction and Fruita and ride our trails and eat your pizza. So I'm sure you have brought a ton of people here through the movie. What was <laughs> it really like? When you say that, I just was looking through some of those comments just when they replayed it at Thanksgiving, like a bunch uh-huh. of stuff started showing up in my social media and I was like, wow. <laughs> Crazy. <Yeah. laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah, it's, it really is. What was it like filming that? I mean, those uh, scenes of you guys writing are phenomenal. Did you, was it an all day shoot? Did you have to do it over and over again? What was it like to shoot? It was multiple days. They came out in the, in the fall of, what was it? 2017? No, 18. 18, thank you. Fall of 2018 and the spring, spring. of 2019. No, no. Seven, 17 yes, and 18. Sorry. 17 <laughs> oh my and gosh. It's yeah. all Clark. Yeah. Thanks, COVID. <laughs> yeah. 17, so on 17, we had gone up. It was just going to be short. And so mm-hmm. we know we're friends with the filmmakers, um, Ben and Travis. Um, and we became friends with them through coming in to eat pizza, mm-hmm. which is kind of funny. Um, and we had no idea that that's what they did until we were in Telluride for Mountain Film one year. And they had a movie in. Uh, movie named, uh, called Red Gold, and it's all about um, the pebble mine in Alaska. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, and so it was really moving, but we had no idea that that's what they did, and we were like, that's Ben and Travis. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really cool that we uh-huh. knew them as, you know, we weren't super tight with them, but we, you know, they were our customers who became friends. Mm-hmm. Uh, so then we see them having this really great moment with this other movie, and then over the years, they've done a lot of amazing things. And then they reached out to us about this film. And we were like, yeah, whatever. Like, sure. We didn't really think much of it. We were just like, okay, well, tell us when, because we need to make pizzas. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sure. Um, come on by and bring your video camera. We'll do a little yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so they came on by with their video equipment. And I remember we actually camped up in the book list and we brought Stromboli and we did Stromboli over the fire. Mm-hmm. Um, and we shot really early in the morning. And so if you watch the movie, there's some parts that it's really, really green. 
That was the spring. That was the spring. And then it transitions yeah. to brown. And then it's <laughs> not. Which is like the fall. So green. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then they, so they only shot for like two days in the spring. And then the fall, they came back and they actually had a full on crew of people with them. It was probably like the two of them and three other people. I yeah, think. two or three other guys. Um, and I think honestly for us, it was, I don't know, it was kind of like business as usual. We just, mm-hmm we knew them at that point like we had become friends with them so it was pretty i don't think either one of us felt weird or nervous or anything i think when they were in the restaurant it may have made some of the staff feel a little like oh my gosh what's going on um but they quickly but the employees that were in the movie were so great i mean yeah yeah they were fantastic they were fantastic yeah the section yeah. with matt gets me every time every time <laughs> Yeah. And, and they're still with us, you know, Matt and Sarah and Devin, mm-hmm. they're still, they're still on our team. And it's just, I think for me watching that movie and thinking about those kids and hearing what they say, if that's all that I personally ever get out of the hot tomato. Oh my gosh. I mean, every business owner, yeah. that's how that's gratifying. Cool. Yeah. It's really gratifying when your customers and clients are happy, but when your employees are happy, that's yep. really important. And, and the fact that they're still with us now through like this challenging year. And like, yep. I'm having coffee with Matt tomorrow morning because mm-hmm. we have a coffee date every few weeks and just check in with each other. And I think that's so important to have that. With these, yeah. It just, you know, not, it's definitely important all the time, but I think it's especially important now. Yeah. Well, let's talk about this challenging year because restaurants have suffered exponentially and you all have had to close your dining room, but thankfully the product that you produce pizza and salad and stromboli is takeaway friendly. But so, so what's it been like for you this year? Um, you know, stressful March, April, May, we're like one giant month all combined together. And you know, we did, we did the bulk of our work in the springtime, you know, we pivoted our system to, to go only we've stayed to go only. We haven't reopened. We're still to go. So at this point, while there's still the stresses of trying to figure out the schedule because it's like a giant game of whack-a-mole right now of who's had contact and like who's had secondary contact and what this all means and who's positive. And I mean, it's, that element is stressful, but the actual operations of the business, thankfully we dealt with that in the spring and then we've stayed with the same model. But it was, it was a lot of meetings with our leadership team. It was a lot of meetings with staff. It was a lot of just, you know, the information that we were getting was changing every five minutes you yeah. know, constantly like on the CDC website and on Mesa County's website. And that um yeah it was it was it was stressful um i'm really really thankful that we do pizza i I really have my heart goes out to restaurants that have done food that's not necessarily something that people consider takeout friendly and Mm -hmm. i'm amazed at the creativity that i've seen from the restaurant industry to compensate but for us our takeout was already about 30 percent of our business And so while it did take quite a bit of work to go to 100% of our business, it wasn't that far-fetched for us. Right. Good point. Um, You know, uh, when my team and I were talking about who do we want to interview uh, for December, we thought about we wanted to do somebody in the restaurant industry to highlight um, how people can help and what people can do. I mean, obviously, eat out and get takeaway as much as you can with the local restaurants. Yeah. I know you all are friends with a ton of the restaurant owners in town. What, what else can we do besides just eat, eat out, <laughs> buy gift cards? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's cards. all those things, but mm-hmm. I think, I think also just be really being really mindful of mm-hmm. what the other people on the other side of the counter are dealing with. And, and that's something that we talk about a lot with our team, with our guests. Like we never know what someone's dealing with when they, when they come to the, to the window, to the counter. Yeah. <laughs> window. Now, window. <laughs> I know, yeah. You know, you just never know what's going on in their day to day. And I think 
I think for us as a community to be really mindful of, of how much stress that, that, that the people, the employees that are taking care of you, mm-hmm. so you can get your pizza or your burger or your sushi or your coffee, or whatever it is, they're dealing with a lot of people mm-hmm. that may not be in their, on their best behavior and have the best energy right now. And that's okay. But just be mindful that on the other side of that, they feel that too. And I've always struggled with that being in customer service. I want people to treat our team just like they would treat me or they would treat Anne and no differently because we're all one. Like we're a team. We're all in the server is not there to be abused. Right. Yeah. And I and I I agree with you, Anne. I feel my heart goes out to all the other restaurants. I mean, in a lot of ways, we have it pretty easy because we've this is part of our model mm-hmm. and it's pizza. That's a part of every pizzeria's model. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we're limited on what we can do just because, and every restaurant is, um, we're limited on how many people we can have in, how many people we can have on the line, how many orders we can take now. You know, normally they're in our kitchen. My God, you've seen it when it's, when it's cranking. There's mm-hmm. like 20 people in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. Now there's five. So we still have that volume. And, and honestly, if when we look at our numbers and we look at pizza for pizza, our numbers have not changed. It's the other pieces that have dropped, right? right. The alcohol, the merch, the salads, the, all the other things that go with it that when people are hanging out in the dining room that they get to enjoy. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that people understand that when they're in these curbside um, models, people don't understand what's still going on in the kitchen. Mm-hmm. You know, and I, I feel really bad for that. Like you, you can't expect food in 30 minutes. Like everybody right. appreciates the orders and the support, but we, we, I think we all as a community need to like calm down mm-hmm. for the workers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Grace to these yeah. business owners and our hard workers. Graciousness, patience. Yeah. yeah. Cause not only are we struggling with, lack of revenue coming in for restaurants. But now, you know, now that cases are going up in the Valley, like restaurants are very much dealing with staff shortages yeah. and, you know, that can be pretty detrimental to your operations. Yeah. Wow. So many challenges. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about fruit in Colorado. And um, obviously you, you, you ended up there because of the trails, but what really keeps you there? What does fruit mean to you? at this when we first moved to Fruita we thought we'd be there for like five years I think uh, it was like three years yeah maybe (laughs) and then we were going to move to a mountain town we're going to move to Durango or Eagle or one of these places and then we you know realized that we couldn't afford to move to Durango or Eagle or one of these places and then we opened a business Uh, so we stayed in Fruita but what I love now we we were just at Best Slope like a week ago meeting up meeting up with some folks for coffee. And I loved that we could walk out our doors and we could walk to the coffee shop and we could sit down at a table with other people, would walk to the coffee shop and watching just the community vibe in the town that's been created was was really cool. And what I realized is like Fruta has become this town that people want to move to Mm -hmm. and that you're like, of course, like, of course people want to move to Fruita. It's awesome. We have a brewery, you know, we've got like this awesome little copper club tap room. We've got the coffee shop, like we've got walkability, we've got access to recreation. And, and so in a lot of ways, this place that we moved to that we just thought was this temporary stopover has become pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. And it's always been awesome, but it's just gotten more awesome. Well, and you have great leadership in Fruta. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Oh my God. hundred percent. Yes. I think not only do we have great leadership, but we have great business owners in Fruta. Mm-hmm. And I think we all work together to try to figure out how we're not going to find just the benefit for ourselves, but how we're going to find the benefit for the entire community and everybody that comes here and visits with us. Yeah. Great. So what's next? I mean, uh, obviously 
when restrictions get lifted and you have in-person seating again, woohoo, we're all celebrating. You guys are going to be so crazy busy for so long. <laughs> people are just going to want to spend so much time there. And uh, including me, I'll be there. Yeah. But, uh, what outside of uh, getting through COVID, what's next for you ladies and what's next for the hot tomato? Um, I think right now, um, you know, we're working with Tom at coffee about doing various things. Um, he has some ideas that he wants to move forward. Actually, we were, Tom and I, right before COVID, went to Penn State and took the ice cream class, <laughs> which was amazing. <laughs> is, there, is there ice cream? Uh, it's uh, going to happen. It's the biggest thing yeah. to so that was going to be our next business was going to be ice cream. Um, and then COVID happened. So that's been put on hold. And I think honestly, for us right now, we're just gonna, we're just gonna see how the whole thing plays out. And, you know, I, I think like everybody, we don't really know what the next things are going to be for our business. It's just mm -hmm. right now, how do we keep everybody employed, keep our food quality where it is and not have to um, drop that quality because of food costs. And that's another thing in the restaurant industry right now. Food costs are crazy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can't just change it every day. So we're trying to be really mindful of that. But I think, I think what's next for us is just to really walk away from this with having an incredibly strong leadership team that can continue to move the needle forward, you know, without us being in every day. Like we're definitely in a position right now where we're going to be moving into more of an advisory role um, and we are actually in the process of selling the hot tomato to one of our employees. So is that, that public knowledge now? It is now. I guess it is now. <laughs> she just published this podcast. Are yeah. you aware of that, Christy? Yes, Jen had told me a little bit previously, but just okay. a little. Yeah. 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 So we're, we're yeah really... I felt like Jen was just being a little cagey about that. I was. <laughs> I was like, do I say it or don't I say it? It finally came out. But I, I think it's, you know, back to the reason I was looking at all the comments on the movie. <laughs> that really made me really like, wow, we have to let people know. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing's changing. It's just, we're going to be on the other side. We're going to be taking a paycheck from the hot tomato <laughs> as an employee versus an owner. Mm -hmm. um, but the beautiful thing I think is that we're always going to be the founders and yeah. our, our footprint is always going to be on this community. And, and that's really important. So I think the next piece for us is what, what is our, like, how, how do we, like help this legacy, if you will, move forward. So it's here for the next however many years. So everybody's kid can get some hot tomato pizza. Yeah. <laughs> Feel all the feels. <laughs> oh, I love it. And, you know, it, you, you have created a, a, a legacy with this business. And I know that with what you've begun and, and with you advising in the future, it will continue and really excited to, to see you guys get to do some different things. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, anything else you want to share before we wrap up? It's getting a little dark there. It's getting dark all of a sudden. I'm like, how do I make this lighter? <laughs> I've got all these bright lights in my office, and it's just continuing to get a little, little dark back there. But yeah, it's getting dark. <laughs> I guess it's time to put our pajamas on. <laughs> right? And finish your whiskey. Right. Oh, that's a way gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, allowing me to ask you some questions today. And thanks so much for bringing hot tomato pizza and stromboli to the Grand Valley. Thank you. Um, thank you, Christy. You're yeah, awesome. Thanks, Christy. Appreciate you. <laughs> okay. Happy holidays to you. Yeah, thank too. you. Bye. All right. Bye. And thank Bye. you. Thanks to all of our listeners and watchers for joining us for the full circle podcast and uh, we don't have our our next guest lined up yet we've got some people that we've got some invitations out to so i can't even say who's next but we appreciate you ladies the hot tomato and we'll talk again soon thank you Bye. thanks for listening this is christy reese signing out from the full circle podcast